Is quantum mechanics, or qu more specifically quantum field theory, relevant to th the macroscopic world uh, and OCT? I'm sort of going to cover basics in one talk to the two different areas. Is quantum mechanics, quantum field theory important to OCT, and is it important in medicine? And we know it's important in chemistry, and we know it's important on things the size of the universe, like black holes. But it can, is there a case that can be made? It's relevant um, to medicine and to OCT. And the answer is yes. And I'm not going to be able to hit all the points in this one lecture, but I'd just like to go over the basics and get people, give people some degree of understanding why th I'm going to support that statement in the next few talks on this. And this is part of the OCT tutorial series, but also on the complex uh, quantum sys macroscopic quantum systems uh, lectures. And so the first half of the talk is qualitative, and I'm going to explain some of the principles. But ultimately, you have to demonstrate it quantitatively. I mean, you can't just make these statements that defy the um, reality we know and not be able to back it up in some way. And the way we back it up is mathematically. And so this supports two areas and publications that we've already produced. So we have the 2014 paper where we derived how macroscopic phenomenon can occur in biological systems. This is one of the areas and people don't have a problem with ma quantum phenomenon occurring at the microscopic level or have little problem. I can't say I completely don't have any problem. Uh, so, y you know, electrons being quantized, that doesn't really freak people out or van der Waal forces, but um, and then at the size of the universe, the um, universal effects are due to quantum mechanics. That doesn't seem to bother people. Where people become bothered is at the level of our reality, mesoscopic or and macroscopic at the level of the body, at the level of multiple cells. And in the 2014 paper, we argued for that. And I'm going to start laying down the basics for it because it's pretty pretty detailed in terms of the theory and in the quantum field approach to OCT and the number one area where this is important with OCT is within noise and image quality with OCT is dependent on noise and understanding the quantum noise limit and we're going to be stealing for OCT or not stealing but um, a lot of it came from the work in gravitational waves. How they were able to detect gravitational waves was driving down the quantum noise. So what is, the, I mean, you know, when people raise quantum mechanics and relativity, and relativity is still considered a classical science, quantum mechanics is a modern science, is the only modern science. And so wh what is so bizarre about them? Well, you know, space time, space and time were created in the Bing, Big Bang, and space time is constantly being um, uh, created by mass energy. So, where is the time when we were born? If you're 40 years old, where did time go? Well, let's say it's 40 light years into the galaxy, but the galaxy is more than 40 light years away in diameter. So the time you were born, if you're 40, is still in the galaxy. So why didn't you go with it? Because you're held together by the four forces, electromagnetic radiation, strong force, weak force, and gravity. And so time is still there. And the galaxies are f going apart, not based on momentum. They're separating because space-time is just constantly being created. And I'm giving examples of how I'll use the word bizarre, but it's not bizarre if uh, you work in it. It's just the way things work. Uh, and how, But how different it is 
from the classical world. How much time does a photon experience traveling 10,000 light years? And the answer is none. It gets there instantaneously. But, and that is pretty much a violation of relativity, and that still needs to be sorted out. So particles uh, sp spread across space-time if there's no interactions. And this actually occurs in photosynthesis, which is why it's so efficient relative to a photo detector, and we'll bring it up. But what, what causes things to localize? The reality we look at when you're looking around right now on computer screen or the, um, you know, the chair you're sitting on is because of interactions. Interactions, particularly entanglement, causes localization. That's why a ball is a ball, because of all the interactions. Otherwise, it would be non-local. Is light a particle or a wave? And I'm going to demonstrate it's neither. All right, first of all, it gets there instantaneously. So um, it's an instantaneous energy transfer. It's a virtual particle. But uh, when, and then two particles, or more than two particles, become in, when they become entangled. So we take two particles, are what we call entangled, and then separate them in space-time, but they're entangled from a quantum standpoint, which means they su they're in one reality still. So what you do to one instantaneously changes the other, no matter the distance in across space-time. And particles are constantly being created and destroyed in the vacuum. The vacuum is not empty. It just, out of nowhere, you get a positron and an electron. And this helps to explain things. It creates noise in our OCT systems through the detector port. But um, so why does a black hole not violate the law of entropy thermodynamics? Because it's yanking things together. And so if that were the case, if it was condensing everything, that would violate entropy. But it's pulling the vacuum apart. So if the vacuum creates a p temporarily a positron and an electron, if the electron gets pulled into the vacuum and the positron is released or vice versa, then that increases entropy. So uh, people struggle, though, when you're in between. When it's small or big, um, people have less problem than when that these phenomena can occur at the size of a cell to a human being. Now, the problem is once you start describing quantum mechanics using classical rules or classical descriptions or classical pictures, you've already lost. It's inaccurate. And it's just, it has to be described mathematically. Um, and as I said again, people are, uh, people get freaked out or in denial when you start talking about macroscopic and mesoscopic mo quantum systems being sustained over distances, let's say, of five feet. And um, I want to go into just this analogy for explaining why it's why we can't use words to explain quantum mechanics. So this is a you know water lilies by Monet. And you see the beautiful colors, and you can see the shades of blue, and distinguish that. Say that looks green versus that looks blue. But if we only saw in black and white the limited world of our classical world, okay, you couldn't describe the green versus the blue on this image. We can use a meter, which is the analogy to mathematics, that shows uh, RBG, our bl red, blue, green and the numerical values of each and produces what a numerical value for the color. But you have no way of describing it because it, we're assuming a being that only sees in black and white. So the, the way quantum mechanics books have been written or described has changed in the last 30, 40 years. And it used to go back to the spring and the Schrodinger type. You start off with Schrodinger equations. And absolutely, this is not a criticism of that. Um, the, uh, you know, obviously people like Dirac, I consider Dirac the greatest physicist 
of the 20th century and maybe the greatest of all time and Schrodinger their work is great but we things that have been learned over the last couple of decades have changed what we view as fundamental in quantum mechanics and indistinguishability which is symmetry similar to symmetry or identical particles or non-locality non-local uh, holding a ball the ball is local um, and entanglement where the interaction makes two particles one entity uh, this is fundamental to space-time it actually creates space-time space-time is created by interactions by entanglement so everything goes astray with i so what uh, what is i or complex numbers so on the top shows a complex number where x is the real part and the y has an i in front of it and what is the i well let's start off with the fact that numbers have a square root so or so uh let's take four the square root of four is plus or minus two so what is the square root of negative one well nothing that we can um point to in our reality so we use i and it's i is interesting because people we go back to Persian empires or, uh, you know, before zero AD, and they figured out a lot, you know, roughly around those times, zero and um, uh, r real numbers were all sort of um, f figured out um, back then, but it wasn't until the 1500s that I, uh, after 50, around 1550, that I began becoming appreciated or complex numbers. And so we have this problem. We have something we can't take a square root of. And so it's a great tool in classical mechanics. So if you want to describe a wave, you can describe the amplitude with real numbers and the wave portion uh, adds the phase but that's a trick that's a mathematical trick now with quantum mechanics the imaginary part is part of existence and so if we look at the axis so a let's take time let's say the horizontal axis is time and the vertical axis is imaginary time and so let's say a particle exists partially in time and partially in imaginary time. It's somewhere on that axis. And this is a very difficult concept. And we're going to get into it when we have particles, a single photon traveling down multiple paths that does that because its existence down each path contains an I in it. It contains an imaginary number. And so, um, it wouldn't be described as real and real here means it's classical the classical laws and so white is a ball a ball it's localized interactions particularly entanglements that are bombarding and hitting you know light hitting the golf balls uh, dust hitting the golf balls localizes them and a golf ball becomes a golf ball and um, this concept of localization and this change this paper was really important in us getting there and so you, you I'm sure you've heard of the Schrodinger's cat you, when you don't open the box the cat is both dead and alive and maybe it's a little bit too much for a cat maybe not and it used to be described the, the state between where the cat is both dead and alive is called a superposition and where it's one or the other is the real state. And they used to draw out the superposition arrow miracle happens, and then you get one or the other state and which one is random. And so this sort of started to point toward these um, uh, interactions with the environment. So we've 
I'm going to discuss coherence in the mathematical portion, but co you have a coherent state, which is um, a complex concept, but it reduces to some form of reality when it entangles with the environment. And a great, great book. Now it's he the author died, and that there's a second author now who's got the newest edition, but. Sikori's book, when I've given talks at physics departments, um, and it's weird when an MD goes and gives talks at physics departments, but usually the person who teaches a physics course wants to talk about this book because it's a really good, great book. It approaches quantum mechanics no longer with the classic Schrodinger spring analogy. Um, but does it from a more modern perspective. And it was really brilliantly done. And this is me. I throw my these slides in the middle because people have seen them so long. And nothing. the only thing relevant in my background is a, a large portion of my early quantum mechanics was self-taught. So I'll pronounce a lot of things wrong. So Egan states, I'll call Eigen states or Hermitidian. Uh, operators, I mispronounce the words because I learned them from reading. So photosynthesis and magnetoreceptors are two of the greatest examples of where biology, and I'm going to do both biology and OCT, cover them simultaneously here, but where quantum mechanics plays the role. So when we look at photosynthesis, photos, uh, I'll start off with a uh, Photo, uh, a photo cell or um, a solar panel. And um, it has an fit maximum efficiency of around 24%. And that's the maximum it can achieve classically. So what happens is light comes down and the electron bounces around till a receptor can grab it and make it into electric charge and start the process of giving you electricity. But photosynthesis has an efficiency of around 100%. So the, the electrons are delocalized. They're an electron soup. Their reality is spread over the receptors. So light comes down, excites the blanket, and whatever area the blanket is over where there's availability, the blanket gets sucked in right there, uh, a quantum of light, the equivalent to the quantum of light. So the efficiency, it's instantaneous. It's, there's no bouncing around electron. And so the efficiency is 100%. But there's nothing classical that can describe this. An electron soup, where electrons' realities are spread over space-time and uh, over each other. And the greatest example of quantum mechanics is a molecule cryptochrome, it's in my opinion, the greatest example, because we don't even completely understand it. I had a, so uh, cryptochrome is found, it's the magnetoreceptor um, in the back of the eye in migratory animals like birds. It's in our, uh, I believe, suprachiasmic nuclei. It's part of the clock proteins, the circadian rhythm, why we shouldn't sleep with a blue light on. It's also in inflammatory cells. But um, in its excited state, when it blow, uh, absorbs a blue photon, it's a more sensitive magnetoreceptor than anything man-made or anything known. And uh, its properties are still somewhat baffling. I had exchanged emails with the senior author on this paper who's a pioneer with this molecule and um, the point is we don't understand it, it has um, it can detect signals several orders of magnitude below the noise level so imagine you're in a football stadium and the noise level is 100 decibels you can localize a pin drop the, the it's equivalent to localizing 
you know, a pin dropping while people are screaming in the stadium, which is unbelievable. And we understand principles of the quantum mechanics, but how exactly it does this. And I do have some theories on it, but is amazing. And there's gr has been, I love elegant experiments like the time reversal experiments. And I call these the Bruin experiments because he's the first author on numerous of them. But the, um, but the design is so elegant, you just wish you were the one who actually uh, came up with it. And so you pass a particle like, I think it was cesium, through a field and the, then it keeps going and the cesium and the field are entangled. So if you do something to one, then the other is uh, altered. But then you pass another cesium atom through the field and now the two cesium atoms, even though they're different locations in space-time, the cesium atoms are entangled. So if you do something to one, um, the other one, something happens to the other one. So that was entanglement swapping. The field and particle were entangled, and now the two particles are entangled. And then th this particular paper shows how decoherence can break that down. So we extended this. The, quest the question is never, can quantum, quantum phenomena exist in a, uh, dimensions the size of the human body? Absolutely. Can non-locality exist over the length of the human body? Absolutely, if there's no decoherence. And so m most of the major approaches, um, and this holds with photosynthesis too, is try to block decoherence. But in this paper, we took a different step. But this has been, for instance, the problem with the photosynthesis. As you isolate down, the structure around the photosynthetic unit is such that it maintains the quantum state over a, rel a mesoscopic system on the level of molecules, uh, but not a whole human body. But so we took a different approach in using quantum communication systems and uh, path integrals came up with a different mechanisms how, and there's numerous, how these states can exist without not necessarily stopping decoherence, but sort of correcting for or accounting for decoherence. And decoherence, again, is interaction with the environment. And it's not an easy thing to do. You can't put a shield around it. And you can't use things like redundancy. Mm, it le and there were a series of papers. So back in um, 19 or 2006, we published a paper where we um, in effectively entangled two reflectors a distance apart using what are called thermal second order correlations. And I, I have to tell you, if you attempt to read it, I've come back and read this paper twice. And at first I don't understand it. Then I think it's wrong. And then I read it and realize, okay, it's correct. But I was so busy trying to make sure everything was mathematically correct it's a really poorly written paper. And this was done more elegantly in a science paper entangling diamonds, except we came back and, and analyzing their data. They didn't actually entangle the diamonds. And I'm going to bring up why this is relevant in a moment. But uh, they expanded the uh, quantum system. And we published the quantum field theory of OCT in 2018. So let's talk quantum physics. Let's do an interferometer. And we can use an OCT interferometer, which is a Michelson interferometer, but let's use a Young's interferometer. So um, you can see that we have a barrier in the middle with two holes. And for right now, let's assume that two, if we were to throw, get bowling balls, if this was really big, send bowling balls through on the left the ni that would be the pattern or um, we would see bowling ball hits in two locations that's a particle and obviously we can use something 
baseballs or something smaller than that. If we had water waves, we would see a pattern like we see on the right with the eye, where the peaks and troughs of the waves as they interact are um, uh, forming a diffraction pattern or a, a interference pattern. Sorry, the light is diffracting out of the slits, but it's interfering at the um, surface. And at the surface, so again, light in reality is created at the detector and it's instantaneously at the, or sorry, is created at the source and instantaneously at the detector, but the paths that were in between um, alter uh, the pattern that's going to be. Now, if these paths are indistinguishable with these subatomic particles, whether we're dealing with a photon or an electron or a cesium atom or a helium atom, then we're going to get the pattern on the right. But if we have do something as it goes through slit one versus slit through two, then they become distinguishable paths at the detector. So but at the detector, we can distinguish which paths it went through. Once we have that knowledge, then the pattern that arises, or once nature has that, is the left pattern, the NI pattern. So um, this actually gets more complicated in the fact that it just isn't two paths available. It's an infinite number of paths. It's called the path integral and made present originally sort of formulated by Dirac and moved forward by Feynman. But so uh, I'm going to use this example. Um, so light goes through, tangles with the screen to the right, and it goes through the slits. But we're going to do something different. And excuse me, I didn't ideally draw this. And we're not going to send through light. We're going to send through a particle that's more easier to interact with. Like, uh, uh, let's pick a, a cesium atom that can g change the excited state. So let's say now, OK, we send the cesium atoms through and look at striking on the screen. What does it look like? It looks like I, the diffraction pattern, if the two paths are completely identical. If by the time it gets to the screen, you cannot determine which path it went through. Okay, so say now at E1, you see E1? E1 is we're generating photons, but the photons can only hit the top path. Okay, now the paths are distinguishable. Cesium atoms going through the top slit are um, going to be at, in an excited state where the ones going through the bottom slit are not in an excited state. So we end up with Ni. Now, though, let's do something slightly different. Let's move over to, and I should have put E2 on the bottom, but if we do something where we far the, a little closer to the detector, things coming out of the lower slit, we stimulate with the same light, then the cesium, atom, cesium atoms are now both excited heading toward the detector. Um, and so the um, they're both identical again, though in an excited state and different from when they were admitted. But they're identical, so the pattern when it hits the screen is going to be an interference pattern. And technically with atoms, this is a difficult experiment. Now what gets even, so depending on if the path is distinguishable or indistinguishable, if we can tell from the detector plane which path it came through, then we're going to get a classical pattern. If we can't tell, then we're going to get a non-classical pattern. So you're thinking, how are atoms interfering? How are they colliding and exploding with each other? Well, OK, let's say a, send just cesium atoms through, but send them through one at a time. Or we'll send photons through one at a time. What pattern will we get? 
the eye pattern. So we'll get the interference pattern. And if we send cesium atoms through, we get the eye pattern because the paths are indistinguishable. So the, the light doesn't behave, light, a photon can only interfere with itself. That started off with Dirac back in the 1930s. So the light is behaving like it be, it's traveled through both paths. And as long as it's indistinguishable, it interferes with itself. It's a very difficult concept, but it's critical to the function. For instance, that's how OCT works. So OCT works is a, OCT is a lot of single photon interferences. So now we need to derive it. So uh, we're gonna use OCT, and, and this is gonna be important for our complex systems too. But all OCT is what's called first order co photon correlations. So you're, um, if you measure at one point and it's traveled down, let's just say two paths, then the interference pattern at one detection site is first order correlations, it, if they correlate or not, if they interfere. So OCT is the sum of many, many, many single photon interferences in this interfering with themselves along indistinguishable paths. And somewhat more accurate, though no words are accurate, that the paths interfere with each other. And I know that's an, a brutal concept. So just going through quantum mechanical language, so Dirac notation, I decided to just drop a slide in. So in the formaliza formalism, we have states and we have operators in the way we're using it. So we're reading from right to left and why it was formulated. So you read from right to left. So I is the initial state, F is the final state, and E is the operator and the energy operator. So if we have I being the initial state of a particle being in multiple energy, superposition of multiple energy levels, F is the final state if we integrate over all possible values of F or sum here, then we get an expectation value, the most likely median value. And if we reversed it, and so I, this is called a bracket. So F is in a bra and I is in a cat or K bracket. And if we reverse the brackets, it creates an operator like E where this P and when we have that little carrot above it, it's an operator. So things like energy, momentum, they're operators that act on our states to give us our values. So we're going to formulate in terms of the number state, the Fox states. And it's interesting that the Fox, that the number state, the number operator is the product. It's not actually a product, but let's use the word product of the creation and annihilation operator, which is consistent with the concept that I said, particles are instantaneously created and destroyed. So in the formulation, a number state, a state with numbers, and that can be a superposition or just an absolute number of photons, let's say 20 or a superposition of it. It's created from the vacuum zero and a vacuum is not empty again. Vacuum energy is not zero, but we, we create it with that A with the cross above it is the creation operator. So reading again from right to left, the application of the creation operator, and I'm gonna ignore the n fact square root of the n factorial, um, gives us the number state. And the number operator acting on a number state gives us an eigen or egen value of the number state. A, a, an actual value that's real. Okay, so why don't I, this is for people who understand physics, people who don't understand quantum physics ignore this 
slide completely. But so um, the number, it's interesting that the, the number operator is the square of a coherent state from the work of Glauber, um, who won the Nobel Prize for his work in the 1960s. He won it, though, within the last 10 years. And um, if we go down and we look at what is the distribution associated with a coherent state, it's Poisian. So you think if we're going to be looking at single photon states, Poisian states would be ideal. Thermal states, which is what OCTM does, has photon bunching as second order correlations, which people assume are photon bunching. But photons tend to bunch. They want to be together, which affects single photon states. But um, first of all, it's not truly bunching, and we're going to limit second order correlations from our calculations completely. But the problem with the coherent state is in the last equation. So the application of the annihilation operator to the coherent state just gives a coherent state. So it's it's not, and the other problems are the, eigen, uh, the eigenstates aren't orthogonal and the operator is not hermitidian, but the um so we we end up with the coherent still end up with a, a coherent state after applying an annihilation operator which is for its discussion here removing a particle and so it's a state that's not necessarily um like a number state the number of photons and so um, to use an analogy, if we remove some atoms from you, whoever's listening at this point, you still are you, and the coherent state is still the coherent state. So we need to, so getting back to our representation, so we're going to be in flock states, and we have, there's two ways I use to represent a photon. The top is the monochromatic. So uh, none of them have a classical analogy. There is no way to classically represent a single photon. So if you if it's monochromatic, which is what happens when it's at the when it hits the detector, a monochromatic wave is infinite in extent. So that's the top one. The application of the creation operator to the vacuum gives us a monochromatic photon. Again, no classical analogy. Or uh, when we in our second order correlation work. Um, which is unrelated to OCT. OCT removes second order correlations as noise. Um, we need to use uh, an actual phase factor and a distribution of frequencies. So the polychromatic photon, which is finite, um, is given by the lower equation. And the problem here is when the detector detects a photon, it only detects one frequency. So there is no um, true represent classical representation of a photon. So um, we're going to be using single paths. Remember there are path integrals. So y this is a Michelson interferometer. Light goes in. It's split one going down. Let's just call the r red arm the sample arm and the blue arm to the reference arm. It goes down R and um, S, and I should have labeled it that way. Vacuum fluctuations enter in through the detector arm, and that's explained um, in the paper on quantum theory of OCT. So first for classical interferometry, so we represent electromagnetic uh, waves traveling down each arm, that's what the top set of equations are, uh, each arm of the interferometer the sample and reference arm, and then they recombined and head toward the detector. And so we add them up here. But detectors only measure intensity. They don't measure electric fields directly. And so we have to square it. And so when we square it, um, what happens is 
we get interference terms. So the first, so if we look at the third equation, we have two DC terms, and then we have the inter two in the interference term, which for a monochromatic wave ends up being can be represented with a cosine. Okay, and this cosine is going to be important when we go to um, quantum OCT. So now single photon interference. So we go to our wave function and we have our ket represented as alpha and beta. And let's assume alpha and beta have the same value. So photon can go down arm one or photon can go down arm two. So it's a superposition. So this is single going to be single photon interference. So the density operator for this uh, is shown first in the second equation. Um, and if we now spread it out as we did for the classical equation, again, for a single photon, the final two terms interfere with each other. We get an interference term. So interference at the single photon uh, interference occurs at the single photon level. Okay, so that's what we're defining here. So first order co um, coherence, which is what OCT does, is a bunch of these um, single photon interferences. And so here now we just can we're going to relate the um, this to classical. Can we bring? We're going to use the coro autocorrelation function. So, um, if you know the first equation again, the ket is like a, a single photon having the option of go the superposition of going down each arm, and we apply the electric field operator, and the form of the electric field operator is shown in the third equation, and So we're going to ignore everything in that equation. The I obviously represents the fact we need to square. When we square the I, we actually then get a real number. Um, A is the um, is the uh, an is the annihilation number. I noticed using E. The E here is not an exponential. The first E X E X P is the exponential. And the exponential represents the phase. So if the going down each path, the phase is different, we end up with a different phase factor. So this is worked out in the paper for a monochromatic wave using both classical mechanics and quantum mechanics, single photon quantum mechanics. And you still get for monochromatic um, constants plus one plus the cosine using with the exponential above you uh, simple trigonometry. And so um, what it works out to is that um, our coherence function, and you can it's actually derived for a Gaussian spectrum in the paper, um, like OCT, a bell-shaped spectrum of uh, frequency distribution. But the interference um, uh, works out to be mathematically the summation of a bunch of single photon uh, interferences. Now, obviously, it, to carry this experiment out in reality, we can say that we can send in one photon at a time and we'll get the same interference pattern, but noise from the electronics, noise from quantum noise, um, all the noise sources would keep adding up. So we wouldn't get exactly the same because we have to deal with the problem of all the noise adding up. So besides noise, does this have any relevance? Is there any other things we can extend it to? And we'll do that in the next couple slides. So first, let's take a single photon experiment. And I pointed this out in the entangling diamonds papers. So if we send in both arms, and if you look on it, it says object Raman. So a Raman is going to change molecule, a Raman shift is going to change 
the frequency of the photon in that arm, but they're identical. So if we pass this just one photon at a time down, hit this beam splitter, okay? A frequency shift is going to occur, but at the level of the detector, um, we can't distinguish which arm it went through. So what does this mean? Now, if the, we, if the um, energy from the Raman shift in um, each arm is not dissipated into the environment immediately, with these single photons, we've just entangled them. And so this is first order coherence uh, leading to entanglement, which wasn't previously described. But it's, a, it's actually expanding the quantumness of the system. And you can imagine you can just enlarge this, enlarge this, enlarge this, enlarge this. But you can build quantumness through this pattern. So if you can build it fast enough and you have ways of dealing with decoherence at the level of the Raman shifts, and this is explained in the paper that's cited, then this actually leads to expansion of a co quantum coherence system. And then going to th the um, complex systems in, in biology, path integrals can play an important role. So if the deco decoherences are only interacting with some of the potential paths, and now we're accounting for all the paths that the photon can pass through or the particle can pass through as it goes through the slits before it could, takes the detector. The summation of the remaining then still leave us with our interference to pattern, though it may have slight shifts in it. So path, the path integral, and this is derived in the paper, can um, decoherence of some paths but not others at any given instant can maintain coherence in a macroscopic system. And it's one of the many ways it's described in that paper. So this is a lot, but the important point is it's an area that's viewed by so many as being impossible. And it's far from impossible to have these macroscopic quantum states. And it, if we're going to ever have a solar cell that has 100% efficiency, we need to achieve these type of states. And I, I believe they do occur in biological systems via evolution, which is explained in the paper. But um, this is a start down that path, and I'm going to go through other in future lec in another lecture the different ways we can compensate for decoherence rather than the feigned shielding, which is pretty much impossible, protecting things from the de de coherence uh, or entangling with the environment. In, and I'm going to do that in subsequent lectures. Thank you.